Judy Gelman Myers with New Jewish Cinema from Jewish Broadcasting Service. And I'm here with Michael Levine, director of Stripes, Matzah, and the American Dream. We have the best months in the world right here, New York City. It's all coming out of right here. The water we use is New York City water, which is the best water in the world. I mean, you want Jersey water? Fine. You buy matzahs from Jersey. That's on you. We have quality. It's not a thing you just mix and throw into the oven. Everything is sorted by hand, by taste, and by feel. You have to hold it in your hand. You have to feel the moisture in it. This guy's been here for years doing this. You know, it's like an artist. You're not going to paint a picture that has no meaning. And that's how we make matzo here. For us, it's like art. No one in their right mind in this day and age would design a factory in New York City on the Lower East Side with five floors. But this is our foothold. This is where my grandfather was, my great-grandfather was. The neighborhood has changed. You know, they've sold everything except the Statue of Liberty, the Brooklyn Bridge. Maybe they're gonna sell that off and we'll come to the realization one day that they have condo buildings on top of the Brooklyn Bridge. I mean, anything is possible today. We could probably operate with half the amount of people, but it's hard to look at those people in the face and say, we could replace you with a machine. So it's just nice the way it works out. We know that times are hard and other factories are shutting down. We're doing a heck of a job to try to hang in there, making matzahs for people around the world. We're gonna stick to our ways. We're matzah makers, that's what we do. Best job in the world. Michael, hello. Thank hello. you for being with us oh, today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that, that the film was much more to me than just a film about the Streitz family and their matzo factory. To me, it was really about gentrification and its effects on family-owned businesses and neighborhoods all around the country. Um, but why don't you talk about the film from your point of view? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's true. Well, I think any you know, family like the Streitz has been in the neighborhood for as long as they have and seen all the changes that have gone in the neighborhood. You can't separate them from you know, what's gone on there uh, over the course of, of their history. So definitely in approaching, you know, the film, I wanted, you know, uh, I thought it was, you know, I, part of my inspiration for making this film was having lived in the neighborhood and seen the changes and the gentrification and, you know, the disappearance of so many family businesses. Um, you know, just in the short time, you know, 15 years or so that I've been here, uh, and knowing that they've been here throughout, you know, the course of a century, I thought it was also a great way of, of kind of going through the history of the neighborhood alongside, uh, you know, the history of, of the Strife family. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the family and, and, well, first talk about the factory, that, that oh, crazy I mean, building what, with those baskets and the... Oh, it's such an incredible place. I mean, from the first moment I found it, I don't know if you want to talk about uh, now, you know, kind of the, how this film, you know, the idea came to me was just coming across this place and really just the visual of it was what initially struck me, not knowing anything, I mean, you know, of course I knew of Streitz and I knew, of, you know, I had eaten their matzah, but I, I didn't actually even know that the factory was right there in the Lower East Side. Um, and I had walked by that block for years not knowing that it was there. And then, you know, one day uh, I just happened to stop outside the window, uh, the front, you know, on the ground floor of the buildings on Rivington Street and the, their ovens run 75 feet the whole length of the building so the, the, uh, the matzah comes out right at the mouth of the oven is right almost at the sidewalk and I just kind of looked in and just for the first time and saw you know pulling matzah out and the, one of the workers without even looking over his shoulder just took a matzah and handed it to me out the window How um, you know which I was in shock and you know I, I came to found out of course this is what they've been doing for 90 years it's just people walk by they hand them the matzah and I guess that's maybe how half their customers probably have discovered the place but like um, you know and I guess after a minute or so he turned around and saw I was still there and just standing there in astonishment and having and so he was like okay why don't you come inside and I was like okay I walked in and it's like walking into 1920s New York City. You know, you don't expect it. You're in the, the super gentrified Lower East Side and there's bars and restaurants and all these hip spots and you walk in there 
and it's just machinery from the 1920s and 60 workers, you know, adjusting gears and levers and the rabbis on every floor working and all this stuff going on. And, you know, I didn't know much about their story, like I said, but it was very clear from that that there was a story there. And yeah, as I came really. to know, you know, the family um, and the kind of the extended family of all the people who work there, you know, that story became more clear and it became really clear that it was something very special. Yeah, um, I was very impressed with the family. Can you talk yeah. about them and uh, their incredible devotion oh. to, to so, this, to not only the, this enterprise that they had built themselves, that the family had built themselves, but to the function that they served within the larger community? They're very passionate about what they do and they're, they're very passionate about the Lower East Side, um, you know, and, and being there. I mean, uh, and I think, you know, they have a connection. Um, well, to each other, they're just, you know, they're a wonderful family. They, they get along in, you know, a way that, you know, they often talk about, you know, that one of the toughest things for a business, you know, existing for generations and generations and having, a, you know, a bunch of family members involved is, you know, families fight and all this kind of thing. They, you know, they've managed to agree, you know, together and get together and, and, and work things through throughout the years. And, and they're just a, a wonderful family. They have that same kind of familiar connection with, um, with the workers there and really with, the community, um, which is pretty amazing. They're very, they're just very genuine, very genuine people, and very passionate about what they do. And, and I think that they understand, uh, you know, what, you know what they've meant to the community. But they're very humble about it. And uh, I, I just, you know, I love talking with every one of them. It's all, you know, different personalities. They, they all, you know, have their part, and they all play a role in making strides what it is. Yeah, I was very impressed with um, the gentleman who used to be an attorney mm -hmm. and always wanted to be. Can you tell his story? Yeah, so, uh, you know, and uh, so he, Alan, Alan Adler, um, so there's three cousins who run the factory today. They're all the, you know, the great grandsons and one great grandson of the founder, Aaron Streit. And the oldest of the three cousins is Alan. And, uh, you know, Alan grew up uh, in New York and hanging out, you know, spending a lot of time with his grandfather and his father at the factory. Um, and, you know, loved the place and kind of always envisioned himself working there. But, you know, his, his grandfather was the, you know, some son of immigrants that, that came over and kind of wanted a, a you know, a better life for, uh, for Alan, as, as he put it. Um, and so Alan became a lawyer and his grandfather was very proud of him for that. You know, and he spent 25 years doing that uh, in New York State uh, as a prosecutor. And then, uh, you know, somewhere around, what, 12, 15 years ago maybe at this point, um, you know, he decided to pursue his childhood dream and left, left law and uh, got into the matzo business. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, he comes to work every day, you know, whether it was on the Lower East Side or now where he's, you know, at the, at the new factory, um, you know, on his motorcycle with a license plate that says matzo. Clearly he loves what he does. Uh, you know, and it's, it's just really cool. And it's interesting because all the family members, you know, none of them started out in the matzo business. They all had different careers and all kind of found their way into it later. Now, as you were, I mean, there's a lot of timing that's, that's going on. I mean, it's now, you know, we're on the eve, of, not the eve, but the week before Passover. And this is also when the factory is being torn down right. and, um, but you've been working on this film for three years. How did the timing dovetail? They, I, I, I believe they were in the pro, they hadn't even thought about selling when you started the film. No, I mean, you know, I mean, they had thought about it at different points over the last, you know, 20 years really here and there, but never really gave it serious thought. And so uh, when I started filming three years ago, they were at a point where they, you know, envisioned themselves staying on the Lower East Side. They knew that they had a lot of challenges being there, but they were doing everything they could to make it work and, you know, were determined to do that. Um, and it became, you know, gradually more clear over the case of, over the course of filming that the challenges that they had, uh, you know, were, were just getting more difficult to deal with. And then it was actually the, the what was supposed to be the last week of editing. Uh, the film about you know a year and a few months ago that they made the announcement uh, that they were leaving uh, the Lower East Side and relocating, uh, which came as a huge personal and emotional shock for me. Of course, everybody there, but as a filmmaker, uh, when you think your film is on the table and the last line is you know we, we're staying, uh, and then it got to a point where they they just couldn't you know they they had to make a move. Yeah, it was it was a. Uh, 
yeah, it, it, it took a, a little while to, to figure out what we were going to do, but, you know, and people were like, well, are you going to have to change the whole film and all this kind of thing? And I, I made a decision pretty quickly um, to pretty much leave the original first, you know, hour plus of the film intact as it was, because I think it represents them as they had been for 90 years, you know, determined to, to be on the Lower East Side and loving what they do and, and being there and all of that. And then, you know, but going, you know, seeing what their challenges are and doing that. And then when the decision comes, then we get more into, uh, you know, how that transition actually uh, took place. But so yeah, you had to go a, back and shoot more footage. Oh yeah, we, should, we then yeah. ended up filming. Yeah, it was not the last week of the, it took another year. We actually just finished the film, uh, you know, uh, really just a few weeks ago <laughs> was the last bit of editing. So, it, you know, we were trying to just get as far because they're still making their transition to the new factory. That's so, amazing. Yeah, uh, so we got in as much as we could until we, uh, we just had to say, all right, you know, we got to stop for now. So. Wow. Yeah. Um, and it, you, you crowdsourced it. I mean, you uh, crowdfunded it. Yeah, yeah. Um, which was, you know, it was, it was kind of, it was a pretty amazing experience. It was a lot of, it was a lot of work, uh, you know, went into, into putting it together uh, to do it. And it was, you know, it was a very intense 45 days or so that we were on, uh, on Kickstarter. Uh, but the reaction that we got just immediately was so amazing. And, uh, you know, it was very clear that the people who were uh, funding us, you know, so of course there were friends and family who were, you know, making donations and things like that, but, you know, the majority of people of the, you know, 600 plus people who were making small donations to this film, um, you know, were people who just, they, would, you know, Strites had been a part of their family for however many generations, uh, and, you know, they just, they had a great love for the, for the family and for this company, even if they had never personally met them, they felt a connection and, um, yeah, really, you know, clearly wanted to hear the story, and they would, you know, they wouldn't just, you know, send their their twenty dollars. You know, they would they would send you know letters with it about you know you know their grandfather you know used to walk by the factory, or they had a relative who worked there, and you know used to tell stories and all these things. You know, you just hear these amazing stories. So more than just you know getting the funding to make the film, which was obviously important, it was also, you know, it made us feel like we were really doing something that, you know, would matter to people uh, and, you know, that we had found a topic that we weren't the only ones that it resonated with for sure. That's lovely. So, yeah, yeah, it was really beautiful. So. Wow. Um, the big, I mean, it's very sad for the family that they had to move. Yeah. But the big losers, I don't want to say losers, but the biggest impact was felt by the workers. Um, especially like Anthony Zapata. Can you talk about, first, can you talk about him? And then can you talk about the impact of gentrification on someone like him who, sure. who didn't have a car? Yeah, to, to no, read, I mean, well, you know. let, me, let me just say first that the family has done, you know, as much as they can, uh, as, all that they can to offer everybody yes. work. Um, you know, so a lot of the people who did work at the factory will be making it up to the new factory. Um, but, you know, as you said, there are some, some workers who were there who were, you know, lived in the Lower East Side. They don't have cars. They can't, you know, they can't make the trip to a new factory. And that's, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, it's tough to see that having, having known them. You talk about Anthony, you know, Anthony, Anthony Zapata, who, uh, you know, Started working at the factory when he was 19 years old in you know, 1983, um, when uh, Jack Strait, the owner, you know, at the time, you know, yelled out the window. To, he was just, you know, a kid walking by in the neighborhood. And he was like, "Hey, Italian kid, Italian kid, you want a job?" You know, which with Anthony does. Anthony does a much better job of that than me. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, and actually, and as it turns out, Anthony is Puerto Rican, and and you know, he wasn't Italian at all, but he took the job and he. You know, he was there, you know, until, you know, for 32 years. Um, and, uh, you know, but yes, when the, you know, when the factory, when the factory moved, it was just impossible for him to, to make that, that move. The commute is just too long for somebody who lives in the neighborhood and doesn't have transportation. But, you know, and, and he had been feeling the impacts of, you know, of the forces, the na I mean, there are other forces that caused the factory to have to leave, you know, in terms of economics and all of that, but in terms of the neighborhood, the same, you know, forces of gentrification that were involved in that, they had been affecting, you know, Anthony and anybody else in the neighborhood for much earlier than that too, right. you know? Right. Um, it's, you know, the, you know, as everyone knows, you know, rents are skyrocketing, it's getting harder and harder for anybody who's, uh, you know, doesn't have a very large amount of money to, to live in the neighborhood and especially 
uh, to come into the neighborhood now. I mean, this was, it was an immigrant neighborhood, and it's virtually impossible for anybody you know, who's not starting off with a very large sum of money to come in and live in the neighborhood now, and that has changed it dramatically. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk about Alyssa Sampson, the urban sure. geographer. She said two things that I found very interesting. Um, that the Lower East Side was a place where Jews from all over the world came and figured out how to be Jewish together. And then she said that um, she was talking about loyalty to the neighborhood until the neighborhood is no longer recognizable. So those, those are sort of two sides of the same coin. Can you, yeah. can you address those issues? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, obviously, you know, the, the Lower East Side has always been, you know, a destination for immigrants from, from all over the world and, and you know, from, for Jews from all over the world for during, you know, the, the largest period of immigration of the 1880s until the, you know, early 1920s. I mean, uh, when you think about the numbers of people that came through, it was, it's just incredible. Yeah. And the number of people who, who settled there and, and uh, you know, and Streitz was certainly a part of that and that kind of, you know, diversity of, 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 uh, of the neighborhood was always apparent in Streitz uh, and, and the workers there. Um, you know, and, and the second part of that, that, you know, it's the neighborhood has changed uh, you know, it's the point where she said it's, it's essentially unrecognizable now. Um, you know, and, and not even so much that, oh, you know, it's not a majority Jewish neighborhood anymore, it's not Jewish immigrants. It's always been some immigrant group or another. It's always been people who don't have, you know, a lot of money, uh, you know, doing kind of amazing things. There's always been an energy down there of new people coming in and, and creating and, you know, whether it's, whether it's arts or whether it's, you know, starting businesses, you know, things like places like Streits and all that. Um, and when it gets to a point where rents are too high for people to really do anything but, you know, just try and work and, uh, you know, just in order to stay there, it becomes harder for that creative engine to kind of keep going and for small businesses uh, to stay there and family businesses. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's what we're seeing, I think, in the neighborhood. It's, it's becoming... Um, you know, it's becoming wealthier, it's becoming more, more, you know, there's more chain stores. It's just, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a loss, certainly. I live on the Upper West Side, and I mean, that happened to my neighborhood 30 years yeah. ago. You know, it's banks and chain stores and restaurants. I'm yeah. not interested in eating at. Right, yeah, exactly. Um, you have some amazing, really, really amazing archival footage. Uh, um, can you talk about where you got it? And yeah, well, uh, you know, Thankfully, uh, there was a film, in terms of actually at the factory, we managed to get uh, somebody um, uh, filmed at the factory in, in the 1940s, and we have like a 20-minute film from oh the Streitz factory gosh. from the 1940s, which is just wonderful. I'd love to just you know, get it out in its entirety, because it's just so amazing, but we used a lot of clips from that. Um, and then we had a wonderful uh, archival researcher, Rosemary Rotundi, who, uh, who helped us uh, discover a lot of the other footage that's in there, and there was really just a wealth of, you know. Where was she looking? Um, oh, just various, various archives, um, and uh, Library of Congress and all these kinds of things. Oh. But beyond that, too, uh, New York Public Library was a great help, um, uh, Seward Park Library. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I'm just, I, you know, I wanted to make sure, I, you know, I think everybody's kind of seen the, you know, the push cart footage on the Lower East Side and things like that. And, you know, that, that's in there, but I wanted to kind of go a little bit beyond that and kind of to create a little bit more diverse expression of what the neighborhood really, you know, has been over the years. Yeah, you really capture that. Thank you. It was nice. Um, what surprised me most was that even though the entire operation was kind of pre-World War II, yeah. there was never a sense of nostalgia or looking backward. It was always a sense of groundedness in history moving forward. And I, I, I feel like that was, that was really kind of an ethic, a family ethic um, that was sort of un unique to the Strites. I don't know if, if you got that sense at all. Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't, I, I think that, you know, obviously they loved where they were and they, they loved the place and had a deep connection to it, but I don't think that they necessarily viewed it so much in a nostalgic sense because it was what they dealt with or, or worked with every single day. It was, you know, I mean, they kind of didn't have time to, to look and say, oh, like, that was where we did this or anything like that. It's like, this is how we make matzah, you know? This is the machinery we use. 
Um, we have to fix it. We have to keep moving forward. We have to get it working. We have to do that. So it's not, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, to looking at it as, as a museum piece, it's like this is how we make our living. Uh, you know, this is our livelihood. And of course, they have, a, you know, a great appreciation for the fact that it's, you know, it's, it's been a part of their family for so long. But yeah, I think it was, uh, you know, and, and that's what allowed them also, I think, to, to get to a point, uh, you know, when it came to a decision of, you know, what do we do? Do we, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, they, they had a few options when they were coming to selling the building. They could have just sold, you know, sold the buildings and left the business or sold their name. They could have just, you know, gone out of business if they wanted to, but they were, you know, determined this is, you know, making, baking matzo is really, it's, it's in their blood and it's, it's you know, uh, so even though they're going to be using new equipment now, I, um, they're taking, you know, I, I think I, I, this is mentioned in the film, all the equipment from, from the factory. Uh, you know, when they first were, were talking about how they were going to move out, they were saying, uh, you know, they're like, oh, I guess, you know, we're just going to have to leave a lot of it here. You know, some of it will, will you know, you know go, go in the trash where we can't use and all this. And then I was like, I don't know that you're really going to do that. <laughs> and as it came closer and closer to actually moving out, uh, you know, they started saving more and more and more until uh, at this point they actually have seven tractor trailers <laughs> of equipment from the old factory. Everything except the ovens, because the ovens are really, they're, they're truly, they're pretty much built into the building. They couldn't be moved. But everything else, I mean, down to the, the doors, uh, you know, uh, from, from the building, it's all, and they're going to rebuild it all in the new factory in working order as, as a museum, which is just, you know, it's, it's really cool. I think they, you know, and, and the doors that the matzah used to come through with the old factory after it was baked, they're gonna put those in the new factory so that the matzah comes through the same doors. So there's, yeah, there's like a wonderful oh. continuity to it. There's definitely, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, they were very reluctant to leave, but, you know, when it came to the point that they had to, I think, you know, they wanted to make sure that there was a a continuum there in between what they were doing and where they're going. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. they were very adamant that they wanted the exact same product. Yeah, yeah. In, coming out of the, the new yeah. factory. Uh, yeah, and uh, I know they, they've spent a lot of time, uh, you know, uh, working, working on that uh, and trying to, uh, you know, talking to all different oven manufacturers and, and everything. And because and, as we actually, as we see in the film, um, you know, they talked to a number of different oven manufacturers, and they, uh, and and no one was getting it quite right. And then they found one, and they were like, "Oh, well, this seems like it just might work." You know, like, and then they, they finally signed with them to do it. And then we found an old picture from the first day opening the factory, because you can never see you actually made the old ovens because they're all covered in plaster. And then we saw a, a picture from the first day of the Rivington Street factory in the Lower East Side, and it was the same manufacturer who had built their ovens on Rivington Street. So. You know, whether they know it or like it or not, they're not, <laughs> you know, they're really not changing anything. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty uh So you discovered amazing. that from your research? Yeah, yeah, you know, they were, like, cause they were like, you know, I, they were like, I wonder if it's the same people who made that oven. And then, you know, I was like, I think I have a photo. And then I looked and yeah, it's uh, Baker Perkins. It's the same company. They've been around for, you know, 200 years or something like that. So, wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, so really, the film really sort cool of influences line. the subject. Yeah. That's fabulous. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, my favorite scenes was, um, and only New Yorkers will appreciate this, when they go into economy candy. <laughs> That's a great scene. Oh. Did, you, did you know that they were? No, that was all just kind of, you know, <laughs> spur of the moment. They were going to the places that, uh, you know, it was, it was Alan was there with his mother, uh, you know, Renee, walking, uh, you know, just around the neighborhood and kind of going to the spots where they knew Evan. Of course, you know, of course, everyone knows each other, uh, you know, who's been there forever. So economy candy, another business that's been, in the neighborhood for you know over 80 years, and what a, what a place you know it, it's so amazing. And it also is. family run. Also family run, fourth, third or fourth generation, I think. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, and just uh, yeah, you can have a lot of fun in there. Oh, that was <laughs> that was great. Um, another moment that I loved in the film was this the, the sequence talking about the Streitz Manischewitz Horowitz oh, Margarita right, all the, the marrying connection. into the same oh, yeah. family. Yes, yeah, uh, exactly. So, uh, you know, 60 years ago or so, you know, everybody, all of the major matzo companies were, you know, had, you know, presence in, in the city in, in New York. And so, uh, yeah, the, the Aaron Gross, his family was actually also, yes, married into the, the, the Manischewitz family and Horowitz. So it was, uh, as you said, Passover Seder's must have been very interesting trying to figure out who. 
<laughs> with matzah was on so the table. So sort of so. A, a, a matzah empire. Yeah, exactly. Even though competing. So. Um, as you progressed with the shoe, mm -hmm. what became the most important element for you? Well, I wanted to be very accurate in portraying uh, what was going on. In, well, they're connected, but in the neighborhood and at Strites. Uh, you know, my, you know, a, a good portion of my reason for wanting to make a film, uh, you know, on the Lower East Side about, you know, some sort of family business, you know, was always, you know, had an idea in my mind. It's because of all the changes I had seen, like I talked about, of, of, you know, so many of them disappearing and all that. So it was important to me to really kind of express what's happening in the neighborhood as far as gentrification and as far as family businesses, uh, you know, losing a foothold here. Uh, and a lot of that, you know, was done also through through the workers at Strites, and I had a lot of you know concern for uh, you know portraying their their situation, and then also um, you know just there's an incredible just generosity of spirit to the Strike family, you beautiful know, uh, uh, that extends to their workers, and and is a part of what that community has always been, I think, and and I wanted to kind of capture that and really show what that is and show. Um, but really also just show the challenges that family businesses face, uh, you know, in, in an economy today. You know, I, I, we've talked about gentrification, but it's other things, you know, they've, they've got competition. Their competition has always been in, you know, modern factories, you know, on one floor and everything with far fewer workers than, than they have. And uh, it, it was inspiring for me. Part of my inspiration was also to just to see a family uh, there was running a business that wasn't willing to kind of give up their their ethics uh, and you know their caring for for the community and their workers in order to make more money. They were they were you know they were doing what they did. They were doing fine doing it, and they weren't gonna you know. And now it came to a point where they had to make this move, but they're still I'm sure gonna have many more workers there than they need to have because they just <laughs> you know I, I, there is just a. Uh, it's just part of their family. They're, they're clearly they're, they're in it because they love what they do. They're and that, very, that really, very special. Yeah, that's that was really what appealed to the story. I wanted to get that across. You did. It was, it's thank beautiful. You. Michael, thank you so thank much. You so much. Sure, thank you so much. Sure. Sure. I'm Judy Gelman Myers, and I've been speaking with Michael Levine, director of Strites, Matza, and the American Dream. Thanks for watching. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to Jim, to Jim, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.